Shalom Uvraha. That's peace and blessing. Welcome to Monday School. I invite you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 10. And if you want to slip back to Proverbs 15, we'll also be looking at the first four verses of that chapter, but concentrating primarily in Proverbs chapter 10. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for another beautiful day, a day in which you have assured us that you are still on the throne and that you welcome your people to call out to you in prayer. As we do so, we think of our church and ask, O oh Lord, that you would use us as a, a place where the truth is proclaimed and hearts are changed. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would uh, provide safe travel for the Nineskis, that for Jean's uh, grandson-in-law, Keith, uh, he needs a touch from above and guidance upon the surgeon's hands. We ask the same thing for Nancy Browning as she undergoes knee surgery. And uh, we ask especially today that you would be with Larry Terrell, that you would raise him up, that you would drive the infection from his body and uh, give him strength and the assurance of your presence and power. O oh Lord, as we open your word, we ask anew and afresh that you would continue to anoint our pastor, to declare the word, that you would anoint your people to listen, to receive the word, the engrafted word that we're told is able to save our souls. Would you, O oh Lord, transform us? In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Proverbs chapter 10. And looking at the first, well, at verses 11 to 14. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but a rod is for the back of the one who has no sense. The wise store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. Let's stop and look at those first four verses, that, or the four verses that we just read. That the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. And... When we consider that statement, of course, it is a metaphor that he is saying it directly, not that the mouth of the righteous is like a fountain. He's saying that it is a fountain, that it is a source, that there is overflow there. There is, if you will, an upwelling, uh, just as you would find with uh, we're told that uh, at, at one time when this country was first new and the, uh, um, that the pioneers were traveling, uh, it was not unusual for them to come upon an artesian well. And by artesian, meaning that it was simply flowing, that there was a great source of groundwater and that uh, for whatever reason there was an opening, a, uh, 
and not a, a structural weakness, but there was uh, a sufficient uh, avenue that the water could make its way to the surface that uh, it, it would uh, gush forth and, and just huge volumes of water. That's a fountain in the respect that he's talking. He's not talking about an art, uh, an architectural element. He's talking about uh, something that they would have seen when they were out uh, in some of their exploration of the land, that they would have seen this as a natural thing, a fountain, a place where there's a flow of water that is uh, it is there to change the situation, whatever it may be. Uh, but it says that the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Now, as we consider this fountain of life, that suggests, of course, water, and in the Middle East, uh, in an arid part of the world that water would be vital to life of any sort. And not just water, but it's got to be fresh water. It's got to be pure water. It's got to be that which, if it has any kind of a, um, a chemical and and I'm talking about a natural uh, mineralization in the water, that if it is to be of benefit, it's got to be something that will enhance the taste, will enhance the ability of that water to refresh people. And a mouth of, of, of righteousness, a, the mouth of the righteous person, has that capacity to refresh, to uplift, to bring healing, uh, to reinvigorate, to give rest. And uh, so we are called to minister in that way with our mouths. That communication is such a vital vitally important part of everyday life and seem to have has seems to have become even more so as we get into social media and electronic means of quote talking that even though it doesn't come out of our lips it's the same idea that there is communication that can either be of great value an uplifting capacity and that which cleanses and edifies and strengthens, or it can be something else. And the something else is described here that the mouth of the wicked conceals violence, that there's a hidden agenda that is the thing that it reminds me of where an artesian spring was something that is is uh, extremely powerful and yet it is uplifting and, and of great benefit, that the other side of that would be um, volcano, uh, the hidden um, magma chambers that are beneath the earth. And that if you are in an area, uh, one of the guys that I work with, did his college work in Hawaii and on the Big Island. And I think the Big Island has finally quieted down after a number of years of eruption, but there are, are places that used to be inhabited that are no longer inhabitable because of all the lava flows that have taken place there. Um, and so, this is that the mouth of the wicked conceals that there's something hot and nasty 
at if you go down very far at all at that it, it's just below the surface and has the potential to swallow you and so you want to make sure and this is through yielding to the power of God that your mouth is a source of sweet fresh refreshing water rather than the raging that that overtakes that engulfs and uh, incinerates verse 12 says hatred stirs up conflict but love covers over love covers over all wrongs and so we see that uh, we have the capacity with our fountain to either stir up or cover over. And uh, well, one of the characteristics of these deep springs, when you see the water come up and well up, in the, it's very unusual to find an artesian spring that has a high, uh, uh, that the fountainhead itself is, is numbers of feet above the ground that ordinarily now what you see is that you can tell there's an upwelling underneath because the water is not static, but that it's got this sort of a sheen. And uh, you can tell that there's water welling up from underneath. And so the sweetness, this refreshment, that it, it comes out of the deeps. And uh, I would say in a personal uh, note that, that that upwelling is sourced in the grace and mercy of God that is set free to work uh, and be in evidence in our lives. Verse 13, wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning but a rod is for the back of the one who has no sense. Now, I happen to have grown up in a culture in which it was not unusual to hear people say, spare the rod and spoil the child. And people believed that to the point where uh, it was not unusual for somebody who disobeyed to find themselves getting hit with something Ordinarily, it was not something uh, that was so large or heavy that it was going to inflict serious damage, uh, but it was something that would definitely get your attention. And the other application, it might be, uh, we used to laugh about it being called the Board of Education, that a paddle that was specially designed and used for striking the, the uh, backside of uh, an uncooperative child. And uh, I've got to confess that on several occasions, I had a teacher that saw fit to correct my verbal misdoings uh, with a piece of wood. And was I deeply hurt by it? No, I wasn't. I was embarrassed that I hadn't kept my mouth shut in the manner that I should have, but the, the, that the rod got my attention. But along with the rod, it says, wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning. In other words, the fact that wisdom has been discovered is, is evident by the things that are said about the way one uses one's words, that that in itself is a sign of wisdom. 
Um, if you come across somebody who just doesn't get it, it's obvious that wisdom hasn't taken hold. I remember talking with a coworker who was on a plant tour at a place that shall remain nameless. And uh, everybody who was on that tour, it was to look at a potential construction project. And uh, it wasn't around here. And the people who are conducting the tour said, before we start, I just want to let everybody know that uh, you have you are aware that you have signed a confidentiality agreement. And what that means is that you are not free to discuss what you see or hear uh, during this trip. And as they were walking from one part of the plant to another, uh, one of the fellows who was there to get a look at the project or prepare a bid began to describe how he had been on another site the day before and that it was a plant that was doing manufacturing for the Department of Defense and that the project that he was involved in was, or potentially involved in, was very hush-hush. And then he proceeded for about 15 minutes to tell anybody who had listened all the details of what he had seen. And the person who was conducting the tour on this day, when they got to a certain point, he called that man over and invited him to leave because he, he said, it's obvious that you do not take confidentiality as a serious concern. And the guy backed up and he said, oh, no, 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 I can keep a secret. I, can, I know when to keep my mouth shut. And he said, obviously you don't. Uh, you've already told us much more than any of us needed to know about the project that that you're preparing a bid for. So it is important, vitally important, that our lips express wisdom. And just because you think it, you don't have to say it. That's a form of wisdom. And that if you say it, to say it in a manner that is uplifting, to say it in a manner that is positive in the way that it delivers its message. Verse 14, the wise store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. In other words, you have the potential to set yourself up to fail. That if you are not careful what you say and how you say it, you may create a situation that makes success an impossibility. Verses 18 to 21. Whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is of little value. The lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of sense. Now, it's very likely that we have covered this in the past, but I just want to reiterate that biblically speaking, a fool is not limited in, in our time and culture. If you say somebody's a fool, it means you can't trust what they're saying because they don't know their stuff. They don't know what they're talking about. And while that's part of the equation, 
that biblically understood a fool is, is defined biblically. You'll remember there's a verse that says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So a fool, by biblical definition, is somebody who lives and acts as if there is no God. They are a godless person. And in God's economy, that is what constitutes foolishness, godlessness, leaving God out of the equation. So, verse 18, whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. So if we apply what we just said about the definition of a fool, that those who are not living as if there is a God to whom they will one day be answerable, uh, they conceal hatred because they think they can get away with it, that they can be hateful on the down low and nobody will ever be the wiser. And they spread slander. And not only is God aware that slander is being spread, but he knows who spread it. So be careful what you say. Be careful what you think. That if you find yourself thinking in a slanderous manner, or in a way in, in which it could be interpreted as concealing of hatred, you have some knee work to do to make sure that, that you get back on right track with God. Verse 19, sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. That's reminding us that you can't talk your way out of sin. Now, you can confess sin, and that's a good step in the right direction. But you can't talk your way out of it. Oh, I can explain that. No, you can't. And we are responsible to God to live not only in a manner that is civil toward one another, loving and encouraging and uplifting, but simply put, we are to act and react toward one another in a manner that does not set us up at ju as judge and jury and unfortunately executioner for some people. Um, we are not in a place to make judgments that belong to God alone. The tongue of the righteous, this is verse 20. Tongue of the righteous is choice. Um, I'm sorry, is choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is of little value. Choice silver is that which has been refined. That it has been through the smelting process several times so that the dross, that's the junky stuff, has floated to the top and been skimmed off. That it's no longer a part. That if you ever buy a, a silver bar or any kind of silver that is uh, and even if it's a coin, that it will uh, tell you the percentage of silver that's there. And what you want is the good stuff, the pure stuff. And, and that, that uh, uh, what we say, that the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. And the reason why it's choice silver is because it's refined it's been through the refining process. And by that, I don't mean that they're a smooth speaker. I mean that uh, what they say 
has been through the process so that they're not likely to blurt out something that is hurtful or uh, off color or unseemly in any way, but rather their words are a fountain of refreshment. Um, verse 21, the lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of sense. Nourishment. The lips of the righteous nourish many. I meant to say this earlier, and I've probably said it in one of our lessons already, but I grew up hearing on a frequent basis, um, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. And that's wrong. That is untrue. That words can hurt. And we don't need to just let our words fly because ah, that, that's not going to hurt them. They'll get over it. Uh, there are some things that you can say that will stick with them for a lifetime. I can think of one of my classmates from grade school to whom... I owe an apology, have never had the opportunity to, to make that apology. Um, and while we were under adult supervision that should have reined us in with some of our, the way that we treated one another, with this particular individual, he took, he took a, a a serious uh, attack and sustained attack by a number of us. And uh, that's not a good thing. And that by, by having a positive message that can build up, that can nourish, it can give an individual a sense that uh, they are of value in the community. Verse 31, again, this is still chapter 10. Verse 31 and 32, from the mouth of the righteous comes the fruit of wisdom, but a perverse tongue will be silenced. The lips of the righteous know what finds favor, but the mouth of the wicked only what is perverse. That from the mouth of the righteous comes the fruit of wisdom. One of the characteristics of wisdom is that it bears fruit. That it just doesn't hang there on the tree. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> It doesn't just hang there on the tree like any kind of fruit. If, if something is made available to you but you don't eat it, it's going to go soft. Uh, it's not going to be of the same value as when it is ripe at, and, and at the perfect, perfect time to be consumed. And this is a matter of wisdom, knowing when to drink something in, knowing when to consume that which is of value. And the reminder that a perverse tongue will be silenced. There is judgment day coming. And in that day, um, the perverse tongue will be silenced. The lips of the righteous know what finds favor. You know how to be a blessing to folks. Take the advantage. Say what needs to be said to uplift and encourage. But the mouth of the wicked only what is perverse. And likewise, you will run into folks who just cannot wait for the next opportunity to say something that's revolting 
or shocking or that questions somebody else's integrity. And that when you run into that, run in the up other direction, when you encounter that, get away. Um, do not be part of that conversation. Uh, and, and you don't have to uh, be um, to, to claim righteous indignation to deal with it. You can simply absent yourself from the situation. You don't have to wait for the punchline. When you find out what kind of a joke it is, you are free to leave at any time. And if anybody ever asks you about it, tell them why. Proverbs 15, verses 1 through 4. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle answer that it it sort of calms the waters. And gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. And if you've ever been around somebody who knows how to do that, you've, you've been in the blast zone and you know it's not a place where you want to be. So do your part to be one of the gentle answers. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. And that gushing of folly, remember, you're a fountain. Are you gonna be a pure fountain? Are you going to be a fountain that's gushing uh, in a manner that that is closer to sewage than drinking water. Uh, you want to be the source of refreshment. Verses 3 and 4, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. That's a good thing to keep in mind. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. That there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. God is aware of exactly what the situation is. And the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. The soothing tongue. And notice, it's a tree of life. It's the right tree. Two trees in the garden. Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it would appear that with a soothing tongue that you have an opportunity to, at least in a little corner of the world, bring back the potential of Eden by having a soothing verbal message to deliver. But a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. If you find yourself delivering messages that crush people, it might be time to look for a different kind of message. It might be time to ask God's forgiveness and to ask him to replace what you have considered appropriate speech with that which is pleasing in his sight. So, having said that, gracious Father, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. This we ask in Christ Jesus. Amen.